Today's webinar is called Advantages of Air Logic, presented by Design World. And we thank our sponsor, Humphrey, for today's presentation today. And uh, just a couple little housekeeping details before we begin. Um, this webinar will be available afterwards at designworldonline.com and via email. There will be a Q&A available at the end of the presentation, so please submit some questions if you have any questions for our presenter. And if you're on Facebook or Twitter, the hashtag for this webinar is hashtag CWWebinar. I'm your moderator. I'm the senior editor for Design World, and our presenter is Ernie Parker from Hennepin Technical College. Ernie worked at the Charlin Company before joining the Army in 1968. He was trained as a radar technician and served in Vietnam. In 1974, he purchased a small engine, construction equipment, and lawn and garden business. But in the fall of that year, he was called to substitute teach in the fluid powered technology area at Hennepin Technical College and ended up teaching full time ever since then. In 1977, he sold his small engine business and started Hydrotech Inc. Ernie has approximately 30 different licenses and certifications of various fields. He also completed his mechanical engineering degree in 1999. I'll take it to you, Ernie. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. What I'm going to try and do is give you some examples in this uh, webinar of what you might think of using AirLogic for in place of doing it electrically or alternative ways and only when it's more practical. You know, our world has changed dramatically in the last several years. Years ago, AirLogic started out in, as non-moving part AirLogic in the middle uh, 60s. And then we uh, had a lot of moving part AirLogic and kind of fizzled over the years with the uh, incoming of all the electronic controls. But there's still many, many, many applications today that electronic controls is not as practical as working with uh, pneumatics. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples up here at the beginning. I love building things with air and hydraulics, but I also do a, do a lot of interfacing with electronics. And here's an example of my blinds. Um, I kind of lifted up the volants here so you can see it. I have a little one inch stroke cylinder that I control for my headboard. I don't have to get out of bed in the morning to open and close the blinds in my bedroom. I don't have to. Here's another picture of it without the volants on. This is uh, my guest room there. But it just has a little actuator on it. The stroke is just right for opening and closing. Here's the, uh, in the background here, you, whoops, jumped ahead of me. Here's where I control the windows also. So when you're looking at this, by using clear uh, tubing, you can run that tubing through a heat register. You can run it up the corner of the wall. You can hide it just about any place behind the curtains, et cetera, like this. But I have these windows. They only open about eight inches, so somebody can't get through there um, if I leave the windows open in the daytime. But I do board here is I have two little valves. I do have some flow controls so I can slow down the speed of the uh, how quickly those blinds open and close. It, uh, if you're half asleep in the morning, you want to stay that way. I also use a little muffler here so the air coming out is extremely quiet. But it's just two valves mounted together. Again, one for the uh, headboard, I mean one for the uh, blinds themselves and one for the windows. I have a number of other things I do with them. I have air hooked up in my house. So I have little Tonka toys that work. I'll show you a picture of that a little bit later. The grandkids can play with. Uh, at one time, I had uh, was in an accident. I needed uh, therapy in my foot. It was really easy to hook up AirLogic and have it pushing my foot back and forth to stretch the uh, ligaments and the muscles in there. So I've used it for a lot of things. I had a pneumatic bed that tilted me up. So when I had broken my back in this accident, I could just push a button and it would stand me up so I could get off and go do some things and not lay in bed all day. So I can come up with a hundred of examples of where I use it. At school, I have a pneumatic whiteboard eraser. And the whiteboard eraser allows me to uh, clear my whiteboards without having to um, 
go there and physically erase it. I'm looking for a schematic symbol to come up here, and I'm not seeing it right now. Let me move forward a slide or two. We're having a little bit of technical difficulty. Is Lance there, uh, Bonnie? Yeah, I'm here. Let me uh, try to get that. Uh, I'm not Let's getting see the. See if I can get that working. Let's hold on one second. Some of the other things that I use is he's working on uh, getting the graphics to come up. I had a. Um, a mezzanine here at work that for years I had to climb up the stairs every afternoon to shut off the lights after the students went home. Well, I could put in a three-way switch, but the walls were concrete, etc. I used a little tiny uh, AirLogic um, valve. The actuator looks like a push button on electrical, but it's just an air hose that goes up and pushes down on a little cylinder that would shut the lights off. At the same time, I have circuit breakers. I have three 480-volt, uh, three 225-amp uh, circuit breakers that I can kill in the lab if somebody forgets to hook up an oil line real quickly. And that's another example of where I've used this air. I believe we have it working now. OK. And working with these air valves, I'm going to talk in terms of both pneumatic and electrical. Air logic was intended for electricians, that they could do things with air in the same language they were familiar with. In electric, a normally open contact means no electricity goes through. In pneumatic, a normally open valve means no air goes through. So they're just the opposite. So for this webinar, I'm going to use the term passing and non-passing. And so the term passing will mean a closed switch in electric or an open valve in uh, pneumatics here. So I'm starting out here with a uh, valve that's a two position, whoops, two position valve, meaning, there we go, that we can activate, whoops, if we can activate. Uh, one side or deactivated. Here we have the spring that holds it in this position. When we push the button or hit the pilot on the left hand side, we'll call that the AN, that valve will shift over and we'll direct air to different ports. So typically in air lodge or in air valves, we bring air in port three, the center port, and it diverts air from port two when we push the button over to port four. This envelope right here will slide over and line up with our components. You'll see some schematics a little bit. So we have two positions. If I'm talking in electrical terms, it might be like three right here. You see the three where it can go normally, it goes to number four. Or number two, I guess I have this backwards here. Three is actually shown here going to two, so I would have made this one normally passing. I had to catch a mistake someplace here. And non-passing to four, but then when we shift the valve, it alternates. So it's like a single pull, double throw switch. Then we have the option of bringing air into port one and five. And when we do one and five, we can turn this valve into a two pole single throw type switch where one will go to two, when I push the button here, now the arrows are drawn opposite. And that's the re because of how we use the valve. Air can go either way through the valve. The arrows mean nothing. It just helps the person to track the airflow. But here, when I was doing it with three, uh, three going to two and four, two would exhaust out one when I bring the air pressure in three. So the arrow would be correct for this bottom symbol. But when I switch and do it like this, now we could have technically drawn the arrow the other way. But for the electrical people here, one will go to two when I push the button. Right here. This will slide over, and I'll line up connecting these two. 
before I push the button, five and four are connected. So again, I'm bringing air in one, I'm bringing air in five. I have two separate circuits completely. Five is passing to four until I push the button. Then three becomes our exhaust port. So we can hook it up either way. Either way works well. We can make a double um, pole single throw or a single throw double pole type of switch. And I'm labeling this, so this is how you would physically hook this little valve up. Now typically these valves are very small in size. Uh, I've seen them uh, three quarters of an inch square and only maybe uh, two inches long. One of the unique things about these little valves is that the long-term life, many of these little valves, what they will do is they'll bring an airline into number port three and take come out of two and bring a sensing line over to push on this pilot over here which automatically shifts the valve directing air from three to four and then they hook a sensing line up to here to push it back and it puts this valve into oscillation a very very high speed oscillation and they'll test these things for a million cycles overnight and if they're still running at a million cycles, then then shift as a new valve. You say, wait a minute, a million cycles on electric relay, a mechanic, electromechanical relay, is more than the life of many of them. That's just warm up time. That's just break in time for an air logic valve. These air valves will go millions of cycles as long as you have clean air to them. That's one of the huge advantages. Another big advantage is that they're safe in hazardous environments. We spend a lot of money to electrically enclose switches if you're in a high dust area like farm elevators, sawmills, and places like that where a little spark could be a uh, major disaster. Air, on the other hand, is very safe. When air is decompressed, it cools down. It does not get hotter. And so we use these for intrinsically safe uh, operations. Now here I've showed another slide of the graphics of this valve. And again, one goes to two when I shift it, five is to four when it's not shifted, or we can go the other way through it, and I showed you this before. But now as an electrical switch, these are relay contacts here in the center. This is a push button. And so I can push in that push button and make continuity between one and two and I would then break continuity between five and four. So I'm just showing you the example of, for the electricians, these could be the symbols that you might see in a schematic. Okay, I'm starting here with a two-hand safety switch. Now we have done this for a number of years. There are some modules that you can buy that have a built-in time delay form, both electrically and pneumatically. I'm showing a real poor man's circuit right here. This poor man's circuit is not necessarily OSHA approved. What I mean by that is OSHA approved means you have to hit the two buttons within three tenths of a second. And if either hand is released, or if they're not hit within three seconds, the cylinder will not extend or whatever we're trying to operate here. What I'm looking at here is pushing a button and, okay, how does this not work? Well, there's a T right here in the line. And when I push this button to connect port one to port two, air comes down here, but it also comes out here, comes down here and exhausts out port three. Look at over here. I have three, a uh, couple of different uh, ports, one, two, and this upper one should be considered port three. So when I hit that button, I'm going to hear air leaking out of here, and it means, uh-oh, I didn't hit the other button. If I hit this button by itself, instead of pushing this valve over, air will leak out up here. But when I push both of them together, then air will shift and the cylinder will go out. And again, I'm saying this is not an OSHA approved. When we're moving human beings or dealing with somebody's life, this is just something that could keep a person's hands out of a press, for example, that if these two buttons were mounted far enough away, the operator could push both of these buttons and then make the thing go. And sometimes this is used for lining up parts. You know, I want to get it just right here. I'll push down one button. Nothing will happen until my other hand is back in a safe situation. 
switching from electrical symbols over to pneumatic symbols, I'm using a two-position, three-ported valve. We call that a three-way valve. Okay, again, the air would come in. You can see here graphically it stopped. When I push the button down, I go through this arrow right here, this envelope here, this top envelope slides down to line up with the ports, and air will go through, and it's going to exhaust out this one until I push that one at the same time. And then air will come over to this circuit here in the side, and that um, will make the cylinder extend. Now, this open arrow down here means that's an air source, just like this is an air source. Typically, we would put a regulator on there. This means that the air is coming to us. It's probably been filtered, so it's nice, clean air, and it sure doesn't need a lot of pressure to operate these buttons here. And, of course, the lower the pressure, the more efficient the circuit is. Moving forward a slide here, I'm going to show you some of the different outputs and kind of compare the two together. Here I'm talking, I'm looking for a pulse output. All I'm looking for is a one shot. Sometimes what we want to do is shift the valve, a detented valve. And by the way, when I look at an output here, it doesn't have to go to an air valve. This could go to a hydraulics uh, valve that has an air pilot on it. It could go to a pressure switch to turn on a light. There's all kinds of things that we can do with this. But this circuit here, is a pulse output. So the air is going from port five to four. See, these two are connected. Again, don't worry about which way the arrow is pointing on there. And it comes through here through a second push button. So I've got two switches. The only reason I cross this so the lines would, uh, you can see the lines a little bit better. But these are two switches, are two valves, port five and four, one and two. Five and four down here, one and two up here. So the air comes through here comes through a little bit of a flow control. This is a restrictor. Now this could be adjustable needle valve or it can be a fixed orifice. When we put a fixed orifice in there, it keeps the people with knobitis away from making adjustments. It makes it a little bit harder for them to do that because the orifice is a fixed volume, uh, amount of air that will go through it, especially when I have a fixed amount of air going into this volume chamber. Now this VOL here stands for a volume chamber. It's just a little tiny container, sometimes not any bigger than your thumb. Sometimes it's a hose wrapped up. I had one machine that came in with a 46 and a half inch hose mounted on it, plugged at the end with a tag on, volume chamber, do not cut. In electricity, we would call this an RC circuit, resistive capacitive. We use it for timing. When we want to ramp up something, speed it up and slow it down, whether it be with hydraulics or electric, we use an RC circuit. And by controlling how fast we let the air go in, it controls how fast this air chamber charges. OK, in this case, we're doing something a little bit different. I could have put a check valve around here and let it charge instantly. But let me uh, walk you through the rest of the circuit first, and we'll come back to that. When I push both of these buttons simultaneously, I will get the air that's inside this chamber to move forward. But at the same time, when I push these buttons down, notice that four and five are connected down here. But what's going to happen when it shifts, four is going to open up to three, and it's going to empty this air chamber backwards. So I'm only going to get a pulse out here. It's a one shot. I push, if I push both buttons together, I will get a very short pulse of air out of there. And again, that can be used where we want to control a detent valve. We just want to pulse it. We want something very short. We could set this up as a larger chamber here or a smaller orifice that we could set that pulse to be as short as a fraction of a second, or maybe you want it to be longer than that. If it was for a minute, I wouldn't consider it a pulse output. But it could be done by adjusting the size of the orifice. The smaller the orifice, the bigger the volume chamber, the longer the duration is going to be. Over on the right-hand side here, I have a pulse output also, but this time I'm using another valve. These valves right here can be very small valves. They can have push buttons on them, look just like a NEMA push button on, the, on an electrical box. They can be 
a number of types of different valves, but I'm adding a relay valve here to it. So again, the air comes through. This is normally passing. That means air goes through port 5 to 4, 5 to 4, 5 to 4, comes through, charges this volume chamber. And then when I push both of these simultaneously, we're going to energize the pilot on the end of the valve. That pilot is one of these two pilots right here, this one or this one. In this case, it's the pilot on this side, on the right, uh, left-hand side. And when we energize it, it's going to make this go open or non-passing, and it's going to close this. And so we will have air coming out here. And the reason for this, this could be a large pneumatic valve. It doesn't have to be just small volume. It could be a huge volume of air going through here. One of the systems I seen at the uh, years ago when the Ford plant was here in St. Paul to charge up air tires. No air goes through the valve stem. They have two big discs that uh, squeeze together on the side of the uh, sidewall of the tire. They have an air volume chamber there, and they squeeze down, and then they quickly separate the two uh, discs. And with the higher pressure inside the tire. It blows the tire onto the rim and has just the right amount of pressure. So that's already determined by the computer. But they squeeze the two sidewalls with two steel discs and then separate them quickly. The tire is full. Not an ounce of air went through the valve stem. Might be another example of where you might want a pulse output. You just give it there. And then they can have a check valve to, be, to prevent it from coming back out until, um, or they don't have to do that, excuse me, because they've got the tire valve is already in there. Okay, more symbology. Again, you see the same thing here. I'm just trying to do this so you can follow through as I do that. And again, the push button and the uh, normally passing and non-passing. Looking at our next circuit, next pitch slide. If I can get it to index forward for me. Here we go, thank you. This one, we're doing something very similar, but here we have a maintained output. You're gonna see a similar schematic where I've used the relay valve. This is for a high horsepower applications. The air will come through here. It'll charge the volume chamber. And again, you could put a check valve around here to charge the volume chamber instantly or you can let it take a little bit, but usually these are pretty small, so it doesn't take, you know, this is only going to take three tenths of a second to discharge, so you know it's not going to take much air to fill. Three tenths of a second for an OSHA-approved uh, two-hand safety circuit. So the air is going to come through here, charge the chamber, it comes down, and this is a shuttle valve. There's one ball in here, it's like two check valves with only one ball. It's Maybe if you're a hockey fan, you could relate that here we have a game of hockey and you only have one goalie. That ball can only cover one goal at a time. So when the air charges this chamber, it's going to push that ball down and seal off this side and bring the air from the top to the right. And then it's going to stop here. See, port one is plugged down below here. It's plugged. So we get ready and if we hit both of these simultaneously. That RV1, the pilot of uh, the heavy relay valve here, or even a small one, will activate. Immediately opening, or this will go passing. That makes one plugged off, and one and excuse me, five will get plugged excuse, right here, and one and two will join. The air will come through here, and immediately come up and push that ball off uh, the seat from down here because we've lo we're losing pressure up here. And so it locks it in and seals the air into here and keeps this relay valve energized for as long as we hold those two buttons down. So here we have a full two-hand safety circuit, an OSHA approved, and we can adjust that down to the time that's required. Usually I've heard the number is three-tenths of a second that you have to get the two buttons in. If it's longer than that, this air chamber will have exhausted from port four back to three. You get one and not the other. So here we go with a maintained output until the operator lets go of either hand. And as soon as you let go of either hand here, the air 
and this pilot is going to exhaust from port two back to port three, and we'll have to start over again. Take your hands off the two buttons and reset. It's a nice thing with there. There's no button here that we have to reset um, each time that we're getting ready to do again. All we have to do is take our hands off the two buttons and push again. So then we added this line down here as an output. So this can go on and do whatever we want it to do. Uh, activate a hydraulic valve, again, hit a uh, pneumatic valve, hit a uh, pressure switch, whatever we want it to do. And as long as we maintain these two buttons uh, down, we will have it. We can put in a sealed circuit too, but this one I'm just showing you uh, where it's maintained as long as you push the button. Now notice here, the change in this circuit from the previous one, I had a T in the line. Well, the T in the line, air could exhaust it. When it came down from the top, it can exhaust right down through here from two to three. If air ever got this way and go up, it could exhaust back here. So the shuttle valve is used in place of T's in many applications. These shuttle valves are not like hydraulic valves. They're very small, very compact and uh, do a job. They're a soft seated thing. You probably won't even hear them shift from side to side, just a small little contact valve. So as we look at this circuit, what we really have is two push button valves and a third relay valve. Do we have to have the relay valve in here? No, we don't. We could put in larger valves up here and skip the relay valve. There's always more than one way of hooking up the circuit. So if you didn't want to go to the extra valve, you can leave it out and you could have a maintained output here. Um, but in this case, the beauty of this is that if there's, for some reason, you have a leak in the system, it won't matter because this will be bringing in new supply of air all the time. It'll maintain your compressor air here so we don't have to worry about leaking out. But again, we shouldn't have any air leaks in the system. Okay, moving forward to our next slide. Here, I'm showing an example where we're going to seal it in at the end. Now, I want to emphasize the previous circuits. One of those circuits is a whole lot safer than the previous circuit. The previous circuit where we just had, you can push down one hand and at any time you want to put down the other hand, that's not an OSHA approved safety circuit, but it could be used for things that we're not that concerned about, but we just want to keep the operator on their toes. Now this one, we're going to do a sealed end, so we can operate it from either hand and then seal it in at the end. Now this is not a two-hand safety circuit. This is where I want to be able to make a cylinder move from one of two locations and not have to hold the button. So again, if you're in the electricity, this is like a latching circuit on a holding relay. We push the button and the relay locks on. So here's the application. I bring air in here, pilot air pressure. I push the button, air will go down, push this shuttle down, push that shuttle down and shift the valve over. Okay, the cylinder goes out. Now we could have drawn, this is a, a limit valve. This is a valve that we will mount up here or it could be uh, someplace near the cylinder that when the cylinder is fully extended it's going to close this switch. Over here I drew a valve with a lever. I should have really had a cam on or uh, some kind of a cam on it but what it is is a third valve at the end of the stroke of the cylinder so I can push this button the cylinder goes out and this latches on. Okay, or I could push this button from a different place, a different location. Air will come on through, push the pilot down, the cylinder goes out. When the cylinder gets out, here's, hits a limit valve, I can then take my finger off of these buttons and it will stay latched on. Converting my symbols from a push button to a valve I always need three ports in the valve. You notice our electrical symbols only show two. But I really need that third port to drain. I can't use a go, no go valve. That's one thing you have to remember in air logic. I have to have that exhaust port. So when I take my hand off at the trapped air in here has a place to go. 
But here's the symbol. It comes in. I push down um, this valve. I will have continuity between 1 and 2. I'll push this down. I have continuity through here, and it'll push the valve over. When the cylinder is fully extended, it's going to hit this one. Air will come down and latch on. So you see the difference between the two symbols. These are called ANSI symbols, American National Standards Institute. And these are air logic symbols or sometimes electrical symbols. We're trying to copy. Remember I said at the beginning, we're trying to imitate a pneumatic circuit with the electrical so that electricians can read the schematics and follow through on it. One of the big advantages of air logic is though you do not have to hire an electrician, you do not have to hire a plumber to hook this stuff together. That anyone can do it. It's intrinsically safe and it makes for a nice compact uh, circuit. These airlines can be really small. A quarter inch line is bigger, much bigger than you need for this. You can run much smaller airlines to this and again hide them away. You just push your fittings together, your air lines right into your fittings, the air stays there. We have a lot of little quick disconnects. You just pull the ring and pull the hose back out. You can redo it. There's nothing to burn out. If you hook the valve wrong, the only thing that could happen is the cylinder would go out when you didn't want it to go out. So if you're starting out and setting up the circuit, breadboarding the circuit first, you can get all the bugs out of it, get it hooked up right, and there's no smoke that's going to leave this circuit and it won't work. This is one of the huge advantages of the air logic. So this is sealed at the end of the stroke. That means the operator can walk away. We could tie in a two-hand safety circuit to this and put this sealed function in there and have it uh, once something is clamped together, the operator can go off and do something else. And again, not have to deal with short circuits or anything like that. Okay, now let's expand a little bit with my circuits. Here I'm using one valve that has the um, ability to have both a pilot and a push button. And what I've done here is I'm bringing air in ports one and five. Now for you guys that work in pneumatics alone, I don't know if you've ever considered using port one and five for inputs and putting an air regulator in both port one and five and use three as the exhaust. Three is always labeled in. One and five is always labeled exhaust, but we can hook a regulator, air regulator to these ports and have high pressure pushing the cylinder out and real low pressure pushing it back in if you want to do that. And that saves a lot of air. Every 14.7 PSI additional air pressure takes one more atmosphere coming out of the air compressor. So if you want to save some air in your shop, if you're doing work going out and nothing going back in, cut the air pressure by putting in a regulator here. Cut that air pressure and the cylinder will go back and it will only fill up with maybe 10 or 20 PSI instead of shop air pressure. You, have, you won't have to buy a new air compressor as quickly. But here we're running in pressure enough to run the cylinders. I didn't get into the air regulators. This is just an air circuit. And I use this for my pneumatic whiteboard eraser. I want to uh, clear the board. I push the button. Air will come into port two. It's pushing the whiteboard eraser against uh, with a cylinder. It's a rodless cylinder going across the top of the whole board. It's pushing, but it creates a pressure here. And that pressure comes back and holds the pilot energized, just like an electric holding relay. I push the button and it latches in. At the same time, air is coming over here. There's a check valve here, so air has to go through this orifice to charge the accumulator. See, I'm going the opposite way through an orifice this time. I'm slowly charging this accumulator. When the previous circuits, I charged it real quickly and discharged slowly. This time, I latched on instantly, and it's coming up here and slowly filling this accumulator. And again, this doesn't have to be a big air tank. This can be as small as your finger, your thumb, with a little tiny orifice here. And as that fills up, it's going to pressurize this pilot. So here's a, a two-position, four-way, five-ported valve, as we call it, with two pilots and a push button. Well, when this air pressure starts to get close to this air pressure, you see the spring on this side? The spring is going to take over and push that valve back, provided you have your hand off the button. 
So I push the button, it immediately latches on. I continue to talk as the whiteboard eraser is erasing. When it gets all the way to one side, by that time it's timed out and it's pushed air pressure here, pushing the valve back. Now air will come up here, pushing the rod in, and the cylinder retracts and exhausts it out of tree. So I don't have to stand there and wait for it to do it. I don't have to send the eraser across the board at 60 miles an hour and hit a hard stop at the other end. Uh, it works very, very well. So anytime I want to extend and sit there and dwell for a little bit and then retract, here's a very simple circuit. Notice I'm only using one valve in this case and a little tiny flow control and an uh, air receiver. In fact, you can buy this as one package if you would like, all but the cylinder. Again, I'm using the same valve. As I index to the next one here, I'm doing it with two separate valves. You say, well, maybe I don't have that valve. I don't have a pilot valve with a push button on the end of it. What I do have is the ability to take a second valve, just a three-way valve. Remember, you always want uh, a three-way valve when you want to go passing and non-passing because you don't want to trap the air. I have to have a place for that air to exhaust. So I bring the air pressure in here. I have my shuttle in there so I don't exhaust or up here yet. It pushes the valve. Then immediately air pressure starts to push the cylinder out. So I have that system air pressure here. So when I let go of the button, the shuttle valve will slant, go down here to the bottom, seal it off, and maintain pilot pressure in this air until the cylinder gets out. And maybe we don't want to go back right away. Maybe we want to sit there for 10 seconds or for a minute. We just size this all accordingly, and eventually this air pressure will build up close enough to this pressure that the spring can push it back. So here's a way of doing it with one uh, five-ported valve. We call it a two-position, uh, four-way, five-ported, two exhaust ports normally, and a three-way valve. Kind of a plain Jane circuit, but it's very simple to do, and these hoses, like I say, are very small. You can run them any place that they're not going to totally melt. You can run them, like I say, inside furnace registers if you want. I run them. Uh, you can run them inside electrical conduit. There's no code that says you can't run a small air hose inside electrical conduit. Now, you can't run high voltage electricity in with low voltage wires. You have to have separate conduit for, for that, but there's nothing that says you can't run a, a very small airline right through your electrical conduit that I've seen at this point, and I get updated on my electrical license every couple of years, so maybe someday they'll come up with something like that, but at this point, or you can run separate airlines. You can run several small airlines through electrical conduit if you want to, just to protect them from the elements. So this is one of the advantages of it. Moving forward to our next slide, I'm gonna show you some of these valves. Now they look big in this picture, but these are not big valves. And here's a little push button. It's called a two position, three way. That means there's three ports on there. We have the in port. We have normally what would be cylinder one and cylinder two, but it doesn't have to go to cylinder. And here's our exhaust ports. This can be mounted physically on the side, or we can put uh, mount it into a panel and put a nut around this thing. And all you're going to see is this on the outside of electrical panel, or uh, some kind of a panel. Or, and we can put them inside NEMA enclosure boxes if you would like. There's the nut on the end of it. We can put gaskets on there, seal it up a little bit better. This is a two position four way with five ports. Now, here, these are little plastic screws, and it's kind of hard to see it. It's kind of whited out here, but there's a little slot cut in the side of these little plastic screws. And the more you screw them in, the slower the air comes out. You probably have heard the term when in doubt, meter out. And what we're doing here is we're metering the airflow as it leaves this valve. Well, these ports are smaller than this port, but you can buy the valve with the same size ports if you want. And we would label this port one and port five. This would be three. This is our two and four. A lot of flexibility here with this air logic. Here I have one. Um, 
laying on a side, and you can have push buttons on either end. So again, uh, when you go and you say you're interested in doing something with these, I know I've got the phone number for Humphrey at the end. You're more than welcome to contact them, and they will help you put some of this stuff together and make your own unique circuit. I use it. I have a garage with a little loft door on it. I use pneumatics to open that door and to uh, close it. I have a little uh, building where I have uh, I store an aerial lift. I have a door that I need to go out 90 degrees. Again, I use a little air circuit. We can use, it's not like solenoids where you're limited to a very short stroke. You can make that cylinder be as long as you need it to be to do the job. This valve is a detented. Now backing up one, they look very similar. Um, I guess it's not back, I'll stay here with it. But this one, you push the button and the valve shifts and it stays there. You push the other pilot, the valve shifts, and I'll get air out the other way. So you can buy a detented or you can buy a momentary. Moving forward a slide. If we can do that. There we go. Here's some air pilots. And you can see you can have different sizes of them. These will screw right into the end of the valve. And again, in sizing these, um, you can contact your local rep here for that. Or you can do some experimenting if you use adjustable needle valve. It works real well. Once you start working with it, it really becomes fun. Moving forward to the next slide. Here we have a couple of comments that uh, I'd like to cover with you. A standard pilot can be threaded into any push button valve and converted to a manual valve, convert a manual valve to an air piloted valve. So you can convert this. You don't have to buy a different valve. They've got this designed in such a way that these options are readily available to you. They have air pilots with snap actions. Actuators of the valve is delayed until the pilot pressure reaches 35 PSI. Air pilots with reset, sharply applied pilot signals of 40 PSI G, that's gauge pressure, shifts valves, and then the operator resists even though the air pilot remains on. And the last one, they have some air pilots with snap action and reset, combines the function of the air pilot with the snap action and the air pilot with reset to one operator, okay? Here's a heavy duty cam operator. The cam operator <coughs> can be mounted where something is gonna hit it. You can see it's rather robust. You can loosen this screw and reorientate this cam. There's uh, splines here that you can orientate it any way you want. Mount the valve solid and then when something comes up, okay, that's your signal that something is happening. Now we can do it with electrical signal. They have solenoid operated valves too. But this is the case, again, if you wanted something all pneumatic because of the environment you're in, we don't have to worry about buying an explosion proof uh, electrical switch of any type. We know this is gonna be safe. Next slide. Here we have a rocker switch. You can mount this into a panel and you can have a rocker switch to shift from uh, one port to another. Next slide, we have a little toggle. Three position, center exhaust. Here's a valve that will exhaust when you're in neutral so we could vent your cylinder ports. This is what I use with my safety circuits for my circuit breakers. When there's no air pressure, within the normal position, there's no air pressure to stop my circuit breakers from moving. I just use a garage door opener to control that, by the way. Here's some of the different options that Humphrey has. Here you can see the little flow controls up here, different types of toggle switches. You can mount these. So we can have a lot of fun with those. Here's one of my Tonka toys and I'm kind of wrapping up here a little bit so we have time for some questions. Um, built about 175 of these when my sons were growing up. I would have them put these together and we sold them to the uh, 
middle schools where and then I had some books to go along with it to teach students how easy it is to hook up air and you can see the little Humphrey V41 valves here these are kind of a quick disconnect you just push in that retaining ring and that air, ho air hose will come out so these students can hook it up try different things the bucket actually tilts you see the air cylinder in here and then there's two lift cylinders I put a regulator back here so that pinch points, that is whenever there's something moving, you have to be concerned that people keep their fingers out of it. And these are fairly young students, that you limit the force so you're not hurting anybody to the extent that it, they're going to have to be hospitalized or a band-aid or anything like that. Here's a bunch of the different ones all set up, and they can disconnect them and play with them. A couple more valves. Do you notice here? On the terminology, they shifted it from port one, cylinder one, cylinder two to normally close and normally open. So we would come in from the port here. So sometimes you'll even have that terminology in the valves. Here's another little guy. Different examples of what you can do, how you can mount them. Solenoid have, uh, solenoids have limited stroke. Air cylinders can have very long stroke and a linear force through the entire stroke. A solenoid, when you double the distance of the pole, it reduces its pole by 16 times. You have 1 16th the power when you double the distance. And why in automation and packaging and stuff, we see so many air cylinders, we need to pull, move something 6 inches or 12 inches or 24 inches. It doesn't matter when we do it like this and here's a little push button you push it and the cylinder will go out you let go of the button the spring inside the cylinder will return so this is probably a typically a shorter cylinder but that's one way of doing it we can also hook up a regular um, four ported or five ported valve here and bring the cylinder back with air pressure here's a little toggle valve just showing you some more of these things and wrapping up here now this picture is kind of hard to uh, see. I tried to get a good copy of it, but here's some of the things. Here's an air regulator, air pressure regulator, different types. Here's our uh, uh, flow control and the check valve, some speed control, shuttle valves. These are all options. Quick exhaust valve, if you want a cylinder to move a little quicker, that would be more for the bigger pneumatic stuff. We can do that. So I'd like to open this up to some questions at this point. I do have a phone number here with uh, Humphrey. If you'll dial that number or their toll, whoops, they should have a toll free number here too. And uh, was... this is Mary again and, and we could uh, we could start with some questions here. If anyone has any, please feel free to uh, submit them in your, in your dialog box there. Ernie is uh, here for another few more minutes. He can answer some questions. But uh, we do have a couple here, Ernie. Um, one is, uh, where do you see you? Uh, where do you use pneumatics and air logic in everyday use? You kind of went over that in, in some of your powerpoints, but where do you see that more in, in, in plants and things like that? I see a lot of air in automated packaging, robotics, uh, wherever they want to move something quickly. Uh, if it stalls out, it does not burn out. We don't have to engage the solenoid, like electric solenoids, AC solenoids, if they don't go all the way, they burn out. With pneumatics, we can push however hard we want to push. I see it on clamp down circuits in, in uh, cabinet making where they want to hold a piece of wood into a router. They'll have pneumatic clamps that'll just come down and hold the piece of wood right in place without damaging it because we can size the cylinder and adjust the air pressure to give us just the amount of force we want. I have pneumatics in my pickup truck with air um, bags for suspension. I have a little tiny air compressor under the passenger seat. I push the button forward. I can raise up the back end of my truck. Some of the upper end vehicles will come with it, the Escalades and stuff. But um, I use it just everywhere. In my lab here, there's so many applications where we're moving cylinders back and forth. And so here's an example. I put pneumatic uh, handicap doors in our local church. And I did three doors with the time delay circuit. As you push the button from the outside, the first door opens, and a couple of seconds later, the inside door opens so people don't have to walk out of their way 
or uh, in a wheelchair to roll over to the side to open the second door. It automatically knows you're coming through. So the first door opens, time delay, the second door opens, the first one closes, the second one opened. And then I had a third door on the other side. That was just a single door. I did all of that for $700. And when I was finishing up, a minister from another church says, we just put in handicapped doors and it cost us $14,000. And I did it. The most expensive part were the two other handicapped buttons. So again, there's ways, there's so many things you can do. And what about that? You know, you think about this handicapped door. The door closers are already in place. So that's the force and the speed that the door closes. All you're doing is supplying air pressure to pull the door open. And you can control that force with your air pressure by putting a regulator in there, just a small regulator. If somebody gets in the way, their crutch is in the way, their uh, cane is in the way, it just stops. Or if there's ice in there, if they latch the door and uh, lock the doors at night, okay, the door, it won't pull itself apart. It just applies air pressure for that short period of time. So that's some of my examples. Great. Thank you. Um, we have a question from uh, Randy Thostenson who wants to know uh, some details about recommended filtration, Ernie. Can you give some details about that? I like to go find filtration. If you can get down anywhere between 1 and 10 micron, you're good to go. Uh, the finer the filtration, the longer the valves are going to last. If you want to go millions and millions of cycles, try to get down close to 1 micron. If uh, the environment isn't too bad, you can go a little coarser than that, 5 or 10 micron. But air, we typically, it's just normal air uh, filtration. Nothing different than what you should do on a regular pneumatic system. Great. And uh, we have one uh, attendee who would like to know a little bit more about the solenoid that you use on your whiteboard eraser. Can you give us some details about the, uh, the solenoid you use there? What I'm using there is just that push button. Let me back up a couple of slides here if I can. go. Uh, whoops. What I'm doing, here we go. I want to correct that phone number on Humphrey here too uh, before we close out completely. There we go. We're getting close. Here's the, on the whiteboard eraser, I do no solenoids whatsoever. I'm just using that one valve with two pilots and a push button. And this, there's nothing electric in this circuit whatsoever, just the air from the air compressor. What we've done is my lab is across the hall. We just took a quarter inch line, plastic um, poly line, tapped it into one of my air regulators in the regular fluid power lab ran up over the suspended ceiling and into it, tucked it in the corner so nobody sees the uh, air hoses at all. And this button is where it's located for me to push it so that I don't have to walk to the end of the board or anything. And we just have those little air lines going. To, so there's no solenoids. And then if you go to this one, if you don't have a valve like that, you can do it with two valves. This could be mounted right by the cylinder. The closer to the cylinder, the better. And then all I need is an airline coming to this little valve for me and back to the valve. So this, again, could be a 3 sixteenths or eighth inch airline coming here back to uh, a console of some type to push that. Great. Uh, and actually, I just got a message that uh, he mistyped. He wanted to know if, uh, what you meant about the uh, what type of cylinder you used. In oh, this cylinder. I have a yeah. – yeah, I'm sorry. I have a rodless was, cylinder. And it could be either um, one of the banded types or the FESCO where it's magnetic coupled so there's no air leakage whatsoever when they're shut off, but it's a rodless cylinder. And then at the bottom of the board, I have a linear bearing to hold the other end of the eraser. So the eraser is uh, a piece of aluminum with several erasers underneath it, just a C-channel type unit to hold the erasers in place. And there's a linear bearing at the bottom just to hold the bottom of the eraser in place but the cylinder is only at the top, and it's just a rodless one. Um, so a couple of different brands, but the Fesco, Fesco is one of those that has a magnetic coupled cylinder. Great. And uh, we have just a couple more minutes, and then we have to wrap up. We have one last question here. Uh, uh, where would you focus AirLogic sales in the next five years, Bernie? 
Um, it depends on who's selling. What I find is somebody that pushes it really has a lot of success in just automation in general because it's so easy to work with. Uh, in union shops where you have to deal with electricians and if they have problems there by working with uh, AirLogic, it's uh, a no-brainer in that respect that uh, anybody at the regular uh, factory workers, uh, millwrights can do the uh, pneumatics and the best thing about it is, is you can control the force on all these cylinders. Solenoids give you a problem. You stall out a cylinder, a solenoid halfway. If it's not DC, it's going to burn out, and your force is constantly changing as you go through the stroke of a solenoid. With Air Logic, you can have the same force starting to finishing. So I see a lot of potential in just plain air circuits, and when it, whenever it comes to something with automation, that's where it's used. Um, mostly, but I've seen it uh, throughout manufacturing, um, even in uh, dr drilling, mining, a lot of air uh, is used in many, many applications. So it's up to the salesman to push it. Great. Well, thank you very much, Ernie. You did a great job, and I'm sure that our attendees appreciated. If uh, anyone has any additional questions, you are welcome to uh, contact Ernie yourself or contact me as well. Um, this webinar will be available at designworldonline.com and via email if you would like to uh, listen to it again or share it with any of your uh, colleagues. Again, you can tweak the uh, information about this with the hashtag DWWebinar. And please feel free to connect with us on all of the various social media channels that we have listed there. And we also um, allow you to discuss this on our engineeringexchange.com. Thank you so much for attending. Bye. Bye. And, uh, yes? One last comment. One last comment. The phone number for Humphrey. They would like you to call us 269-381-5500 is the general number. And I think you've got a number there, too, that could also work for them. But uh, I would say if they don't get through on the 800 number, try 269-381-5500. Either Thanks. number will work fine. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate everybody listening. Fear.